everyone, welcome back. My name is Ehan. I'm the head of global growth for the Founder Institute. Super, super excited for all of you to join us today. Uh, we have these global events usually on Wednesdays, sometimes on Mondays. We just get really good speakers and let them come and uh, present some their knowledge and learnings. We have an excellent, like I am super, super excited. I haven't like stopped smiling all day. We have Wes Bush. This guy literally wrote the book on product-led growth. He's been gracious enough. He's going to be giving us a presentation today, a little bit of a workshop, telling us some of the best practices of product-led growth. If you don't know what product-led growth is, don't worry. I, hopefully, he'll briefly explain it and uh, kind of go into some of the details. But it's a really, really important uh, uh, topic to understand within product management and within the different software, uh, like soft, digital software spaces. Um, with that being said, you know, we're just waiting for everyone to join and trickle in. We, we've had about 350, 400 people sign up. Uh, we expect to get big 150 to 200. So it should be a good event. Um, yeah, let us know in the chat where you're uh, uh, coming in from. I see NYC. I see Buenos Aires. Wow, Munich. Uh, Philippines, Calgary, represent Canada. Montreal, Seattle, Dubai, New Orleans. South Florida, San Francisco, San Diego, Brooklyn. So very, very international crowd for, for everyone. Um, all right. So without further ado, Akshay, do you want to bring up Wes? And like while Akshay is doing that, uh, I'm just going to go over some housekeeping -ish, uh, stuff. You folks will see there's a Q&A button on the right-hand side. Use that uh, to feed us your questions. Wes will do about 20, 30 minutes of content. We'll jump into questions after. Um, and we'll, we'll do about 20, 30 minutes of questions. After um, this, uh, the, the, this kind of webinar is done, you'll break out into different tables. You know, you can jump onto a table. I'll, I'll, I'll be on some tables. Some of my team members will be on the tables as well. If you want to ask about FI, you know, feel free to network with each other, learn from each other, discuss what you've learned, and, uh, you know, keep that networking going. Um, awesome. Uh, while we're doing that, awesome. Mr. Bush is there. Hey, Wes, how's it going? Here. Good. How are you? <laughs> good, good. I, I am I'm beyond excited. You know, thank you so much for taking the time to jump on this. Anything you do is usually like very insightful, very useful. I've definitely learned a lot. I think I picked up your book when it was like V0.5, like it was in beta or something. I remember oh, the yeah. PDF copy, there's PDF, typo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, when, I, when your PLG Slack channel was like 5,000 people. I don't know, you know how big it is now, but it must be huge. But that's so like 15,000. It's huge now. <laughs> wow. Okay. So a popular guy here. Awesome. Uh, Wes, you have an international audience here. Let's kind of get things going. Uh, let me just run this poll here for everyone. Um, so uh, obviously, uh, Wes thought this question would be helpful. But like, if you do you plan or plan on having a self service option for your product, uh, let us know because this will help him, um, guy, I guess, adjust the presentation accordingly. Um, Wes, I'm not going to give a formal introduction to yourself. I'll let you self-introduce to yourself. Uh, but in the meantime, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove my, uh, myself from the stage. Do you want to get your presentation queued up? Let everyone yep. do the vote. And then, yeah, then the stage is yours. Awesome. Well, thanks. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I'll give you the, the high le level view of it. But for the last seven years, I've been basically working with B2B software companies and I was always hired as the, the growth guy. <laughs> Figure out how can you get more leads for a sales team or how to get more people to learn about our product. And so about seven years ago, I was working at these B2B SaaS companies. And what I was in charge of was really just getting leads for the sales team. And what I was doing was uh, promoting guides, white papers. And then I was asking the sales team, you know, how are these leads kind of shaking up? Are you getting a lot of people following up with them? Are they, uh, how are those leads performing? Are they converting? And I had always kind of hear like, oh, there's, there's a lot of resistance. They don't really want to talk to us that much. Um, and so I was always like, is this really the best way for us to really go through and kind of sell and promote our products? And so I always had that kind of like, in the back of my head, it didn't feel like the, the normal way or even the way I purchase products. Um, and so it wasn't until we launched a free trial at the company I was working at called Vidyard, where I was able to see, you know what, this, uh, 
actually could work and could be a way where people could try the product for free and you know be a great way for people to see the value before they made the purchasing decision um but the first time it it actually didn't work <laughs> and yeah me mr plg it didn't even work first time i made so many of the mistakes and then it wasn't until the second time we tried that where it was a freemium product it was a simple chrome extension you could simply click it start recording in chrome and then that thing blew up it went from zero to hundred thousand users very quickly and that was like the first epiphany seven years ago for me when i started to realize oh my goodness there's something to this uh, whole product-led thing. And it wasn't called that at that time because it was way before even we knew about what PLG was all about. But that's when it started to click for me. I was like, okay, I get it. And since then, ever since then, I've been hooked on this whole concept of product-led growth. How do you build a product that sells itself? There's a lot of misconceptions about it. And what I'm going to do here is I actually built a or i'm gonna build like a kind of custom workshop presentation since i know a lot of you are founders and you got to think about how to build a product-led business in a way that that obviously works it's got to be simple for you to do and there's so many myths and misconceptions about it so i'm happy to, to dig into this because it's going to be a lot of fun uh, now a question for the founder institute team what were the results from that poll can we see what that looks like i'd be super curious to see what did everybody kind of vote as far as do you plan or plan to have a self-serve option for your product? And do you have the results from it yet? Yeah, I threw it up on the screen. It's uh, about 88% of the audience so far. Uh, okay. awesome. They plan to have a self-serve or they currently have a self-service option. Cool. Thanks for jumping in there. I still see my uh, the uh, question. I'm like, okay, <laughs> fun. All right, cool. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go through this live and we're going to have a ton of fun. So there's five things we're going to go through today. Uh, this is the what I call the five best practices for building a product-led business. So the very first thing we're going to go through is understanding what it really means to be product-led. And then next we're gonna go through like what actually changes. If we become product-led, what are some of the big organizational changes we need to make as a business? And then we're also gonna go through uh, why does this matter? What should we consider about it? And then I'm gonna go through some very tactical things you could do to actually make it work. We're gonna go through the six main steps of how do you actually implement rollout a successful product-led business, even if you already have rolled it out, there are some really big core things that if you don't get right, your model just won't work. You won't get your users turning into happy paying customers, basically. And so I'll just end on the two big mistakes you really need to avoid. Um, so if that sounds good, thumbs up. I'm excited. Let's dig into the very first thing. So know what it really means to be product-led. So a lot of times when I talk to folks regarding this question, um, there's a lot of different definitions. So I want to hear your definition uh, in the chat. What do you think it means to be product-led? Like what first comes to mind for you? Um, I know this is always fun because there's so many different definitions. And don't worry in the chat if you're like, ah, I'm not sure if this is right or not. Just, just put it here. Yeah, Rob, thanks for jumping in there. You win the award for first. Uh, so no sales team, um, all focus on the product, 80% at least. Cody, product sells itself, don't need an outbound sales team. Um, product is driving the pipeline. It just means you have a good product uh, design. Let the product drive the sales, not the salesperson. Uh, marketing built into the product. Product is the CEO. Awesome. So I love it. Thank you everybody for jumping in there. If you haven't already, just quick type it in. Um, so what I'm gonna try and do is get everybody on the same page about what I believe, I think it means to be product led and what are some of the big things and impacts it means for your business. So product led growth, if we were to define it in simple terms, product -led growth is simply, and you use your product as the main vehicle 
to acquire, engage, and retain users. So at a high level, that's really all it is. That's it. It's just getting those people to, uh, or using your product to acquire, engage, and retain users. And I think this part is kind of understated when you think about it. It's like, okay, what does it mean to actually acquire people? Well, that's where we see the free trial freemium models, where it's like, okay, uh, the product is doing a lot of the acquisition. Uh, when it comes to the engage part, what do we mean by that? So when it comes to someone actually signing up for that free model, well, when they go into the product, the product is actually onboarding people. It's actually helping people see the value. It's showing them, okay, go here, go there, see the value of the product, check done. Okay, great. So it engages people as well. Um, and then for the retention, it's really focusing on that. And it's also doing a great job in expanding users as well when it comes to, oh, upsells. These users are very uh, effective at using the product. Maybe they would find this other part of the product useful. And so you can also use the product to upsell. So that's really when I think of like product-led growth and being product-led, um, at its core, it's, it's really using your product throughout your entire business. So it's more than a free trial. It's more than a freemium model. Now, when it comes to really being product-led as a business, there's one big shift that you need to make as a business. And that's why I got this fancy little, I don't know what do you call this, hexagon? <laughs> so when it comes to the two main kinds of go-to-market strategies, uh, I'll just start with this one. Sales-led, fun, right? Okay, so I always like to compare and contrast sales-led and then product-led, um, but do know this. <laughs> The reason I do that is so you can paint two pictures, um, but there's like a spectrum here. It's like product-led, sales-led, it's not just black and white. Um, so when it comes to a sales-led business, if we were to say the fundamentals of business have not changed when it comes to being product-led or sales-led, the fundamentals of business are the same. Do we agree? You still have to acquire people to your website, regardless of if you're sales-led or product-led, you still need to engage people, uh, show them the value of the product, and you still need to retain them, of course, if you're gonna have a sustainable business. And so if we look at this and we say, all right, a sales-led business, you need to acquire people. All right, so we got that. You still got that component of your business. Next up, what usually happens in a lot of sales-led companies is once you acquire somebody, the next thing you gotta start doing is you gotta focus on this fancy thing called monetization, uh, which is a fancy word for saying, make money. All right, great. So you got monetize, um, acquire, monetize. And then the next part of a sales of business, once you monetize them, uh, anybody in the chat, take a guess, what is the kind of the next step in a sales of business? You acquire them. You monetize them. Yeah, there you are, retain is pretty close. Um, the reason I'm gonna use engage or retain, you basically got that. You're gonna like engage slash retain people. Um, but I'm just gonna use engage for this one to keep it simple. But you're all on this right part. Yeah, the service, Rob as well, renewal. Uh, basically keep them happy, show them the value of the product. Um, that's what you're gonna do. So when it comes to this difference between a sales led and a product-led company. What do you think is the main difference? If these three elements are the same, what changes? All right, you gotta help me out in the chat. What is this? What is the big kind of shift here? Yeah, it's, it's not a person doing it. Um, there yet, engage before acquire. Interesting, engage is first, swap, monetize, and engage. Jose, yes, you got it. Yes, the order changes. Uh, so the reason I see in the comments, um, there is some people thinking engage goes here, and then it's acquire. The reason it's more like this is because you still have to get people to your website. Uh, there's no way avoiding that part. But what really changes is we need to prioritize the engagement part. And what's what I've realized and back to my story that I kind of introduced myself with, hey, you know what? I did this sales led thing for a long time. And then we had a free trial, it bombed. Uh, and then the free version worked. 
the reason I, I kind of start with that is because the very first version where we just had a free trial, we didn't do that much work <laughs> to make it good at this, which was the engagement part. And so in that first free edition of our free trial, uh, it was a video hosting analytics platform. And basically, although we thought we were being product led, we had a free trial. What was basically happening is this. <laughs> we had a free trial here. Uh, that's basically where this fr magical free trial was. Uh, but what, why it wasn't working is because, well, okay, we acquired people, we dumped them into the free trial and they had 14 days to do a bunch of things. They had to upload their video. Uh, they had to put their video on their website. They had to integrate their video with their marketing automation platform. And then beyond that, they had to finally look at the analytics and then they could see, oh my goodness, Maria, you watched my video. And how awesome is that? That was the aha moment for that product. And in 14 days, that was very hard to do. And so we just kind of jump from acquire to monetize. And what happens is the sales team started looking at those free trial folks, said, wow, that product team <laughs> doesn't know what they're doing. Let's go in and save those users. And they started once again, just kind of treating this free trial as a way to monetize. We had not fully embraced engage before. And so I want to ask you a question. So when a product looks like, actually, let's go with this, it's acquire and engage. Uh, let's say you download an app on your phone or something like that. Um, that app, it's really hard to get to value. What do you typically do when you download that app, you can't get to value? Put it in the chat. I want to know what is the first thing you do whenever that happens. I'm sure this one will be quick. First thing, yeah, delete it. Find a replacement, delete, forget it. Yeah, totally. And you're not mean. <laughs> <laughs> but you're acting like it. You're uninstalling, you're deleting it, you're getting it, you're looking for alternatives. And if I was just looking at your responses, I'd say you're pretty ruthless. <laughs> no value, no time. And it's not that you're mean or anything. That's just how we are, how we work. When we can't get the value, we just say, forget it. All right, I can find a better alternative here. So when it comes to being product led, you need to have a really great way to engage people. And when you do, that is truly when your product is able to sell itself. And so if I was to sum up this whole, what does it mean to be product led and leave you with one thing, it's basically this, your end user's success will ultimately become your success. And why that is, is because if you acquire people, you serve them, you give them a ton of value, they're able to access the value of the product in whatever that free model is, your odds of actually converting them skyrocket. So does everybody agree with that theory as far as now we're on the same page about what it means to be product led? And tell me in the chat, is this making sense? Is this kind of hitting home for you? Uh, is this a simple way of kind of describing it? Because I know there's a lot of different definitions of being product led, but truly, I believe this is a simple way of looking at it, maybe oversimplified, but um, if we were to take nothing away, this one liner <laughs> is the secret to being product led. Awesome. So thank you everybody for engaging. Got a nice square there. Cool. So what changes? This is the second part in the chat. What do you think changes? We made one big change. This is all we changed. We basically went from here having acquire, that's still the same, and then monetize. We had that part, and then we had engage. So it's one big change. What do you think this, this changes in your business uh, if you were to implement it? I just wanted to share in the chat. I'll write down some of the options. We're going to kind of create this together because there's so many things here that changes uh, whenever it comes to making this one shift of prioritizing engagement over the acquisition side of things. So type in the chat, what are some of those first things that come to mind? Um, and then we can go through those things. 
Yeah, so the, the UX, the UI, the KPIs, yes, onto some stuff here. KPIs, totally, yeah. Um, when it comes to engagement, those metrics, so much more important. Um, you really do have to align them with user success. Milestones, talk to customers, um, org chart, yes. Totally measuring engagement, um, absolutely. Um, I'll jump in with a couple here too. So your funnel, that thing changes. <laughs> um, so a lot of companies before it's like MQLs, um, now it's more like PQLs. Yay, people are getting value in the product, back to the metrics part. Um, those are super important. Measuring product behavior to understand friction points, where and when a user starts paying, delivering value before getting paid, trial to customer. Yes, so those things are all very important. Um, but here's the thing. This is kind of like an iceberg. And it seems like it's one small shift, right? It's just prioritizing engagement. But here's where I try and push this further. I try and say, actually, it's much more than that. Um, it's also your mission of your company. It can also impact your vision of your company. Now, when you think about it, it's like, well, okay, let's look at the, the most popular uh, about pages of some of the most successful product like companies. What do you typically see? It's, well, okay, we wanna make uh, what we're doing, let's say Zoom, we wanna make communication frictionless. Okay, great, like that's making it accessible. That's making it easy for anybody to really experience the value of the product. Um, that's making the price of it also accessible. And so it impacts a lot of things from the vision to the mission. And it can, yeah, impact the business model. Absolutely. I saw that in the chat as well. And I like uh, the interaction that's going on here. I see some people are upvoting some specific ones. So keep doing that. Uh, if something else or somebody else writes something in the chat that resonates with you, uh, because this is going to make it more interesting. That's for sure. Um, it also impacts your strategy. So how do you do business? Uh, what is your, your basically approach to win as a business? Um, companies that prioritize engagement before monetization, um, part of their strategy is, okay, let's make it effortless for people to get to value. Let's make it super easy. Because we make it effortless for anybody to get, anybody to, get to value, uh, we can really go after more of a dominant approach. Uh, to building our business, whereas something more sales led might be, you know what, this is more a differentiated kind of strategy as a business. It, we might actually go after fewer customers that are bigger, uh, but we're going to do something a bit more complex for them. So maybe if that's your approach, sales led is, is actually the right approach. Um, but if it's not, then it could be more product led. So those are some of the big things of what changes. Um, just going through my list here. So I think that makes the most sense. Um, as far as where we can leave off on there. So know it changes, it's KPIs, your org chart, it's your funnel, it's your mission, vision, business model, it's your strategy. At a high level, those are some of the big things that changes. Uh, now, why does this matter? I wanna hear your take. So this whole big shift to being product-led, what are some of the big reasons why you think it matters? Uh, once again, <laughs> I'm leaning on you for the answers uh, because I think this is way better than me just being like, I know the answer to everything, uh, which is so not true. And it makes it way more engaging. So yeah, customer service, because it requires a total mindset shift. Yes, um, you're bang on. Um, I'm trying to see who wrote the mindset shift. That one was gold. Ah, I can't see it, there's so many in the chat, uh, but I'm gonna put it here as number eight because that needs to be underscored. Your mindset shifts. Um, one thing we've realized even at Product Lead when we started implementing this as part of our strategy is we started to say everything, our one word strategy is value first. And it's so clarifying. And it changes the mindset of everybody on the team because now we start thinking, well, is that value first? Is that value first? And it's funny. It's so easy to think of like what's best for the business. But when you start switching it, it's like, well, actually, that changes a lot of things um, as far as how we approach it. So I'm going to go through why it matters. Um, 
<laughs> Nicola, salespeople are a pain. I was one. <laughs> Love it. Uh, predicts the longevity of your business, different skills, capabilities, also impacts your burn rates and runway, user-centered uh, design and services, priorities, uh, scalable approach. Yes. So there's so many big things um, that I could list here. A lot of them are like, basically, I could sum it up as build a quote unquote better business that's more sustainable. So I think that one can cover a lot, um, which this one, I'll say this one's about you. You've been selfish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm terrible. Uh, just calling you selfish, ruthless. <laughs> I'm having fun. Hope you are too. Um, so yes, this one totally about you. Um, but why does it matter? So for your users, why do you think it matters to them? Um, for people signing up for your product, why does this kind of matter for them? Um, I see some people are saying like user center product design and services that matters. Um, but from a user perspective, why would this matter to them? Yeah, more value, totally. Less friction, absolutely. Um, they get value earlier with less friction, get the problem solved quicker. Yes, less risk, totally. This is true. So for a user, basically, <laughs> everything is better with this model. Um, feel free to quote some bad things that might happen here, but I'll outline some of the other sub points. It's like less risk for them. So that's great, right? Uh, we got less risk, get the value, which is awesome. And a big part of that is like, we're just creating less friction. We don't like that stuff. So we're not gonna have friction for signing up. We're not gonna have friction for getting the value. We're not gonna have friction when it comes to actually upgrading. Um, and a big part of this is transparency. Ooh, fancy word, which goes back to this part. I missed, which we're gonna add core values. Core values change. Uh, I'm gonna point out one here that's usually a part of most product that companies which is transparency. So transparency in everything you do. And you can immediately tell, yes, for users, that's a big part of it. Uh, product that companies are a lot more transparent. Their pricing is transparent. Um, let's kind of riff on that one. So pricing, that stuff's transparent. Product, that's also transparent. Um, can anybody else think of what else is transparent when it comes to product-led companies, what else strikes you as like, oh, wow, that's really good, transparent. Um, because ultimately this comes down to, yeah, less risk, there's functionality. Um, thanks for pointing that out. But there's a lot of great things for the users, engagement model, for sure. Awesome. So we know why it matters. I wanna get to the interesting stuff because I know there's a lot of founders on here uh, who are kind of like me, maybe a little impatient. <laughs> and you wanna just get to this question, which is like, how? does this thing work? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to map out the six steps. And I'm not going to write them all out because I'm lazy. I'm going to paste them. Uh, but I'll go through these one by one. And you're going to know the three main phases of how you actually build a successful product like business. So the very first phase is just how do you get started? Um, now, even if you have what you would call a product-led business or you have the self-serve model, please go through these steps as well. Uh, but the very first thing starts with aligning your team. So we talked about the what changes part. So there's basically two big things here, your mission and vision that you really need to align your team around. So when it comes to your specific business, let's go with this mission. Vision should be the other way since vision is the bigger thing. But what is your, your vision as a business? Is it to make what you do accessible to the world? Is it to make it really easy so that anybody can do anything with your product? Um, now, I know a lot of you have software companies. If you don't, that's totally fine. But um, when it comes to like a lot of 
software companies and like their typical mission. It's like, okay, we want to enable you to do something. We're going to empower you to do, be able to do something. You're going to have some ability that you didn't have before, especially just think of like chat GBT. Now you can do so many different things. Uh, and write the first draft of any blog post or whatever, whatever your kind of use case is. You can do so many of those things very quickly. So get crystal clear in your mission, vision. What does that look like? And then when it comes to building your strategy, there's five questions that I love going through. And I'll go through each of them, but um, we're not going to answer them here, but I'm going to leave you with them to just kind of ponder on later and kind of go through what does that look like for your business. So the first thing when crafting your strategy is you need to know what problem do we solve? That one's really key and a lot of people skip it. I know I did when I started my business. And if you skip it, <laughs> you're gonna get solutionitis and you're gonna be like, oh, we have a solution for everything and then people just don't care about it. So get crystal clear on what is that problem that you solve? That has to be part of your strategy and you gotta be aligned as a team on what that looks like. The next thing is who is your ideal user? So this is very similar to your ideal customer profile. Uh, the reason I use user is because in a product led company, you're typically crafting your product for the end user. So I think it's really important that you prioritize like who is that end user, um, even if they are not necessarily the buyer, but that the ones who will get you access to the buyer eventually. So really get clear on who that is. And if you're just starting out and you're a founder, don't try and get too many ideal users uh, because that will really make it hard to grow your business. Uh, so the next thing is what is user success? You gotta get clear on that one. I see so many teams like run full tilt into this whole product led process. And <laughs> because they don't do this, they, they don't know what is end user success. So they fail at engaging users. So that's really tricky because when you fail at engaging users, um, as you know, you'll un uninstall it, <laughs> delete it, you forget the app, you will, will not come back um, because your organization was not clear on what is end user success. And if you tried in acquiring everybody, all these different ideal users, engagement's really hard. So uh, as you can hopefully see, there's reasons why we have these questions. What is user success? Very important, not skip that. Uh, the next thing is how will you empower your users to win? So I'm gonna give you the cheat code on this one. I have thought a lot about this and I've analyzed a lot of product-led companies. And I've come to believe that it really comes down to making it effortless. And I love this word because there's basically when it comes to your model here, let's apply it. How will we empower our users to win? So let's say we make it effortless, get started. Okay, great. Don't like the size of that one. So let's make it small. All right, cool. So we got effortless to get started and then effortless to get the value. And then we have effortless to actually upgrade. So at a high level, those are kind of the ways that we really empower our users to win. It's all about being effortless and doing that as well as we can possibly do it. So the last part of your strategy is what capabilities must we have to win as business. And for a lot of product-led companies, it's really about value first. How do we do that? How do we get people to value as soon as possible and building that as a, a muscle within the business? Uh, so the next kind of phase, I won't go into it as, in as much detail, not because it's not as important, but because I find most people need to, to focus here on the strategy component. Uh, because if you skip that part and you don't really align it with your mission and vision, uh, everything else moves slower. It's really weird. Like if you don't have a, a very clear strategy, very clear mission and vision, uh, what ends up happening is when you get to the build phase, it just feels like you're going through like 
mud, <laughs> walking through mud because you're you're not clear on who your ideal uh, user and customer is. Uh, you don't know like what to give away for free. What does that user value? Uh, you don't actually have a compelling free offer or anything like that. But um, that's kind of the main reason. So if you're to build this, you got to get super clear on who your user is. What is their job to be done? How do you really help them? And then the next thing is really designing your model. So what do you give away for free? Um, how do you package that? And then the step five is really activating it. And where I find most people um, overcomplicate this is just by like trying to do too much. And really it comes down to three things that you need to really activate this. You need a simple offer. So what is it that you're gonna give away people for free? What is it that they're gonna sign up for free? You need simple onboarding and you need simple pricing. Really at the core, uh, once again, it all ties back to those three things. You get one thing to activate <laughs> here, it's your offer, simple offer. And for here, you need simple onboarding. That's how you're gonna get people to engage. And then for here, it's the simple pricing. It's really gonna have that profound impact of making it easy for people to really understand, and make that decision if this is right for them. And then the last part is just optimizing your model. Uh, this shouldn't be anything surprising, <laughs> has to be here, but you just need to optimize your model. So those are really at a high level, those are the, the main three phases and six steps you need to follow. We call this the, the product-led method. It's what we're working on. But it's really just to make it easy for you to implement product-led growth in your business and actually have like a, a plan of attack. Uh, now, as I, I wrap up here, I know we want to get to, to Q&A and that's the fun stuff. Uh, but the big thing is there's two big mistakes that I see so many companies make whenever they become or try and become more product-led and implement these things. And the first one, why it's not letting me type over there, but who cares? Um, not having clear offer. This one's so big and it is deceptive in how big of a problem it creates. So if I go to your website today and I'm not sure what the heck it is you do. And I sign up for your free offer. <laughs> no amount of onboarding, even the best onboarding, the best pricing and all that stuff, it doesn't matter because I, I just don't know what you do. So you get really clear on who this product is for. Uh, what is that success look like? What problem are you solving? Having that clear offer that solves that problem um, makes it way more compelling. Um, so that's like standard marketing 101, but I've seen so many companies like focus so much on their onboarding and their, uh, you know, engagement strategy when they just don't have a good acquisition strategy. And it's not very clear, like, what is your free offer? Um, the next thing is not knowing what to give away for free. Also known as your product-led model. So... Oh, that's why that's happening. Cool. Nice. All right, cool. So this one is, I'll tell you the symptoms <laughs> that will show up in your business is you'll start to find a lot of times uh, that maybe your free to paid conversion rate um, isn't so high. And so then you start trying to solve it with onboarding and getting people to what you think value you sooner. Uh, but what happens is you actually weren't maybe giving away the right thing for free. And I'll, I'll kind of end on the story at Vidyard with that free trial, that first one we launched. What happened was we weren't giving away the right free thing. And it sounds so obvious now, but when we were in the thick of it, we just didn't know what we didn't know. And so we got slapped across the face <laughs> with this mistake and it just didn't work. And so what happened in that case is our, our initial product was solving very kind of complex problems. And people have these beginner problems, which was before they could upload a video to Vidyard, they needed to actually create a video. And so when we solved that and we gave that away for free, 
That's when the floodgates of users opened up. That's when we were able to step on the hypergrowth pedal and grow faster. And so um, really understanding what to give away for free is such an important concept. And that's one of the reasons why, like at productled.com, that's why we focus so much in our programs. Like here's how to understand what to give away for free because it is so important to focus in on. So um, to really wrap up here, I'll go over the five main steps of what we covered for the best practices. And this is kind of the 80-20 the of how to build that product-led business. One, get on the same page on what it really means to be product-led. I'd encourage you to actually do this with your team uh, because it's, it's so important that you're on the same page of what that actually means. Just like in the chat, we're all on different perspectives. Um, and then get clear, like what changes in your business? Uh, what are some of those big changes? And then know why it matters. So what is your compelling why? Why are you doing this? If you're changing your approach, this is even more important because uh, you got to have some compelling reasons beyond just, it's, it's about us. <laughs> it's about your users. That's part of the mindset shift to being product-led. Um, and then four, know how it works. What are some of the big meaty things you need to do? Use that three-phase process. Um, and then lastly, know some of the big mistakes to avoid. So that's a recap for today. Um, I hope you found that this workshop was helpful. You learned something in the chat, actually, since I'm always curious uh, to kick off the first question for the QA, what was your biggest takeaway from this workshop? I want to know in the chat. So just drop it there and um, we'll uh, go through the rest of the QA session. Yes, it has. Total awesome. mindset shift. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is great. Thanks so much, folks. If you enjoyed Wes's, I've learned a lot. <laughs> I've, pr I've probably read his book twice, but you know, as you go through those frameworks in real time, Wes, I think this is a very interesting format. We've done quite a bit of these. I think this is the first time we had someone go through that structure like on Figma. So appreciate you doing that. Uh, let's kick off questions. So Folks, if you jump over to the Q&A tab, we're going to do some questions there. Please upvote the ones that you think are uh, the most relevant. We'll be able, Let's do about 10, 15 minutes of questions and then go from there. So, Wes, I'm going to queue this up for you. Um, BDB SaaS Healthcare. Can you use PLG as go-to-market bill from San Francisco is asking? Cool. Yeah, great question. <laughs> um, I'll give you a healthcare analogy to... <laughs> Think about this one. So if your tech is something like the equivalent of a heart transplant, like if you took out this <laughs> product, like it would kill the patient or something like that, like or kill the business, like they would have all these loose records and all that stuff. If that's kind of like the tech you're building where it's like very central, needs to kind of be top down installed, um, that's actually something where I'd be like, okay, red flag as far as like being your uh, go to market motion. Um, but here's the thing. I've also seen a lot of healthcare companies uh, navigate this in a really great way that is still, in my degree, uh, product-led, although it's uh, maybe might not come across that way from the initial kind of onset. But in your kind of sales process, you just really get people to go through that free version of the product. You have a free pilot. You set it up. And there is ways to really give people that taste an understanding of what is this product all about? Um, how can it really help me without necessarily having like a fully self-serve, touchless free experience? Um, so that's something to, to consider is it doesn't always have to be black and white, like completely 100% self-serve, um, but there is different um, ways you could approach it so that um, you're not kind of like, I mean, that person rolling it out is doing their own due diligence and they can understand like check done. This this will help us and kind of move forward. But great question. Awesome, thanks. I'm, let's just quickly burn through these. Uh, if I have anything additional, I'll add to it. But um, Francois from Joburg is asking, you know, what's your perspective on pricing when you're doing PLG and self-service? Yes, so this is, even when I was writing the book on product-led growth, one of the biggest kind of things where I realized, I was like, oh my goodness, this is a humongous part of building a product of business. And it all kind of comes down to that uh, drawing I was kind of going through here, which is like, 
monetize. <laughs> it's a part of the business. Uh, but when you consider the differences between like a sales a company and a product a company, you have to build a capability around pricing. That was back to the strategy part. Like you must build a capability around your pricing monetization strategy because it's so important here. It's kind of like, okay, you sign up for a demo and then we kind of like, you know, go through that monetization process. Maybe we have custom pricing or something like that. Um, you don't have to build as much of a capability around it, but here it's, it's front, right, left and center. It's like, I might not even sign up for your product if I see the pricing is ridiculous. So um, understanding like value metrics and what you're giving away for free, um, that's really, really important. And so um, that's really where I would start. I think it's chapter nine. <laughs> I'll put in the chat as well, but the book is uh, completely free, but I think it's the pricing chapter and it goes through basically how to actually apply it um, to a product or business. So I hope you find it helpful there. And it's free, ungated. <laughs> Awesome. I, I love the fact that so much of Wes's content is ungated. Um, it's truly really reflective of uh, everything that he talks about. Um, I'm going to bring up this question because I think you uh, briefly talked about it in the start, but like, I think people are a little bit, a little bit more confused on the whole free trial, freemium, and PLG. If you want to like elaborate a little bit, I think that could be helpful, specifically in this case for June. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, June, great question. Um, I think this like talks a lot about the parts around like the strategy, the mission, the vision, um, and those other components that do change. So when it comes to like what those were, it really was like, you know what, your KPIs would change. Like there is the go to market side of things as far as like that motion. Um, there's also how do we organize our team uh, around even this <laughs> acquire engage monetize um, so that's really important to also consider regardless of if you're b2b or b2c and um, this one you obviously know uh, since it's pretty similar but uh, these are kind of the big ones and also the strategy and the mindset are some of the big things that not a lot of people think about but like what are some of those big mindset shifts that someone would have to consider it's like okay value first you you have to believe in that and you have to believe in this in order for this whole model to, to kind of work. So um, those are just at a high level, some of the big changes that I would really recommend kind of like thinking about and worrying less about like B2C versus B2B differences. Um, because what I'm seeing in this whole kind of evolution of product led growth is there's becoming a lot less uh, overlap between the two or a lot more overlap <laughs> other way. Yeah, not to dwell on it, but I'm reading a lot about like how SaaS companies are evolving and like some people is like the golden age of SaaS is done and, and all that. So maybe that's something you can think about for later, but 100% um, agree with you. Um, I'm just going to pull this one to Dari. Um, Dari is asking more about like how do you optimize your strategy as you're, uh, I guess another way of putting this is, is like, you have an assumption of you're building out all these funnels of how you're building out product and all these product journeys, but obviously like it's an assumption things are going to change, right? Like, like you gave video as an example, there's V1, right. okay, we, we didn't hit the, we didn't hit it on the money we had to iterate. So like, what are maybe some of the things that you can tell to some of uh, our audience? Like, you know, how can they preempt that or like make that, <laughs> uh, that uh, iteration softer because obviously it's more expensive to do these iterations over time, right? And our audience yeah. is composed of early stage, some bootstrap founders. So like, well, yeah, I hope the question there is clear, but like, how would you be looking at these product journeys and iterations as a bootstrap founder is another way of thinking about it. Yeah, that's great. Um, so whenever it comes to this part, I always like to kind of like take a step back and look at like, what are the first principles here? Like, what are the things that aren't gonna change? And when I look at like different industries and like, okay, let's look at like the AI macro trends. Let's look at the uh, low code, no code tool movement. Let's look at like PLG, uh, product -like growth, all these things. Like, what do they have in common? Like, there is there anything? Like they're all kind of seemingly different, but it's like, what do they have in common? It's like, people want their value faster. Okay, great. Uh, we can take that and say, 
is that going to change? Is that like, are people still going to want that in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Yeah. The, like the amount of tools and stuff we're going to be able to do in the next 10 years is crazy. Uh, and it's going to be way faster to do everything we're doing currently. And so it's just like, if we can understand the problem that people are trying to solve and get crystal clear on that problem, and then everything else becomes easier. And that's why I include that as like one of the questions as part of the strategy. And it's the first one, actually, because I find a lot of uh, leadership teams and early stage teams just don't get crystal clear on what that looks like. Because when you're clear on that, it's like, okay, people struggle with this problem. How do we get there? And what are some of the ways we could get people there faster? And so um, that's really the, the, I mean, maybe it's a roundabout way of answering that question, but I really just wanted to understate it because I think it's it's so important and it's easy to miss, um, but just get clear on the problem and then craft that solution around it to, to solve that problem as fast as possible. I think that was a really good response. Okay, I'm going to throw you a nice one. I, I really enjoy, I like this question. How do you scale PLG? Is this a marketing thing or is this, I would say, a referral mechanism? I guess that's also marketing, but it, I, I, I don't think I, I've studied your content quite a bit, but like I don't think you've ever talked, like I have not come across about the scalability portion. And I think this is right. a very interesting kind of question. So, like, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, no, that's an awesome question, Alice. So when it comes to scaling it, there's a lot of different ways you could approach it. And it is not the same as you would consider like, okay, the sales led model is you would hire more salespeople. And for every salesperson, they have a specific quota and then you hire a manager, you kind of grow uh, more linear based on that. Uh, so scaling a product led company is actually, this is back to one of the, the benefits of it too, is it doesn't have to rely as much on people. So if let's say your uh, product led model is converting, let's say a thousand signups per month or something like that, and you have a growth squad focusing on your free to paid conversion rate, and you realize it's only at like two to 3% and your goal is to get it to 5%. So like you might only get 1% in like a month or two or a full quarter of a sprint, you get it up to 5% or something like that. Um, and that growth compounds. And that's because your product is, is doing a lot of that heavy lifting that adds a lot of efficiency as well. And so as you kind of scale up, you might realize like, okay, great, we got 5% conversion rate. Now our other problems are, or our highest leverage point is we just need more people going through this product. It's acquisition related. And so um, it's definitely not as linear or as to think about like a sales led model versus a product led one. Um, but it really is back to that. I wish I had time to kind of go through that um, optimization process, because when you go through that, you might start to realize, actually, this is more of a people problem. Like we just don't have somebody in house who is really looking at the data side of things and understanding some of these opportunities. Like that's the lowest leverage opportunity. And it's really just looking at that. Like, what is that lowest leverage opportunity or highest <laughs> leverage opportunity? <laughs> Here I am mixing up words. Uh, but yeah, going through that part and then scaling up based on where are those gaps on the team. Awesome. Let's do a couple more and then wrap things up here, folks. So Matthias, cool. the best thing, but I don't know if you brought this up. I know we jumped straight into software companies, but like what are, I don't know if you can give a very brief response, like where is it that PLG is not the way to go um, for certain businesses? Or are you heavily <laughs> saying that every single SaaS business should be PLG. No, I actually say like not every business should be. Um, a lot of it comes down to what is your game that you're playing? Like, are you going to be playing like more of a dominant strategy as a business? Whereas like you have the best product, best price. Um, if you're actually going to win in that category, I would take a strong stand and say you have to be product led because you're going to be competing against so many other competitors. It's going to be competitive red ocean, uh, product led go to market motion is way more efficient than a sales led motion. So it's just going to win better there where a sales led company actually might have more of an advantage is let's say you're at a very small kind of total addressable market. Maybe there's like a hundred fortune 500 companies that you're going after and your products just cater to those specific needs. Uh, it might actually make more sense for you to have that kind of sales approach where it's like, okay, we're just solving this a problem for really big organizations and we're just going to go after these people um, that would be a scenario where it would make more sense the other one for a lot of folks here um, if you're early stage is i actually recommend you do a lot of the like onboarding 
manually. <laughs> I have seen so many founders uh, benefit from this, where let's say you have a free trial on your website, where it's more of actually a request a free trial. Your first time you're rolling this out, people can book a call with you to get onboarded for their free trial and you help them or you walk them through what are the steps to get to value and you can actually watch them go through and see where they mess up uh, where are some of those mistakes and then you can build that plan around oh okay they struggled here let's make that easier uh, let's cut out that process oh we had to like manually create this account all the time it's like let's automate that and so um that's really where i would i would kind of like tell people it's like okay early stage try and do things more unscalably uh, to figure out what is that scalable model to uh, grow this up. And then if you're thinking about, okay, strategy-wise, um, know what kind of game you're playing as a business to kind of wrap up. I think that's a great, <laughs> It's as you were talking, I was thinking about, I was working at a SaaS company, a cold emailing platform, and it was very interesting. They were getting leads every day, day in, day out, day in, day out. And it was like people would sign up and they're like, they would abandon straight away because they're like, we don't know how to use the product. And then when we started getting yeah. them on the phone, we kind of had like salespeople be more like support people. And like conversions started to happen just by saying like, hey, I saw you sign up for the product. Like, how can I help you? And then we would give them a curated experience saying, okay, this is what, because like any other SaaS product, there's like 40 different menus. So it's like, hey, yeah. this is what you need to know in the next like 14 days of your trial. If you can send out a campaign, you know, and get value, great. So we were trying to like manually push them. And then obviously that, that info gets funneled to the product team to kind of build out uh, more and more stuff. Um, I think, yeah, that was a great response. And uh, I, I wish somebody told me that like six, four or five years ago as we were thinking. <laughs> about um, we're just here. We have about four minutes left. I think like a good question to end on is like, you know, something a little bit more like, you know, you've been in this space for about six, seven years now, or maybe even longer um, from your video days and beyond. You know, I was talking earlier. I follow a lot of people like Yako from Winning by Design, and they're talking about this golden age of SaaS. Like, where do you personally see like, a lot of these early stage SaaS companies going. Um, because I can tell you my perspective is that now being in a like leadership role, it's like mm -hmm. we got way too many SaaS products. <laughs> and like I'm yeah. getting I'm like what like every single product we on get on board, we, we get scrutinized. Like why are we doing this? Can we not do it with another product? So I'm kind of seeing like a lot of these products, whether they like it or not, enter parallel industries. I'd love to get your thoughts like on like where you see the future of SaaS going. Um, I don't know how, how much you want to kind of share, but yeah, then we can wrap up. Yeah, no, for sure. So you're absolutely right. There's like a ton of SaaS companies. And I think that pace is only going to increase because what we're realizing on one end is, you know, the barrier to entry is getting lower and lower. Every single year, it's getting more easy. There's uh, great places like Founders Institute <laughs> to kind of like start um, and build these companies as well too. So like there's a lot more support, not just like it's easier to actually do this. And then there's a lot more creative ideas as far as like, okay, okay, let's try this out and let's build a company on it. So I think there's going to be a ton, like you mentioned, of those smaller SaaS companies. What I think is going to be really, really important is to win is you're really going to have to to build something that really does solve like a meaningful problem because there's going to be so many SaaS that um, are developed where it solves not really a super important problem. And those SaaS are going to be like not that big. And why? It's because it wasn't solving a really big, meaningful problem. And so I think that part of the strategy is so important. Back to again, <laughs> that question, it's like, what problem do you solve? Does it matter? Uh, and really kind of going through that part and activity to get clarity on there. And so I think like as um, really the space evolves, it's going to get uh, really awesome in a lot of ways for the consumer because it's going to be like, if this isn't customer first, I'm not signing up. Uh, I'm not going to really <laughs> go through this whole process. So it's going to be a lot more product -like companies for sure. I know that for sure because I see so many um, SaaS companies from day one now are starting product-led. But I think the next evolution of this is really going to be product-led companies versus product-led companies. <laughs> How do you win now? And what does that strategy look like? And I think what's going to happen 
And I was writing about this earlier, it's going to be more like free monopolies and where it's like a bunch of SaaS might have to like, you know, band together and create free tools that are completely free and they monetize them through some other different ways. Uh, but it's just a part of extending their free motion so they can really tap into other industries and give their products away for free. So it's going to be like a lot of adjacent opportunities. And I've seen this with uh, companies like ConvertKit giving away a landing page product for free um, that kind of taps into their email marketing tool. So it's like complementary products that also extend their free motion. So I think we're just going to see a lot more of that. Um, and the good thing as consumers is more free stuff. But I think the bad thing is business owners and founders is it means the barrier to entry is higher because competing against free is hard. I think that way you answered it amazingly, man. Like um, very, very, a lot of nuggets here. Folks, I hope you uh, take some of this <laughs> into consideration and process it. We're at the top of the hour here. Wes, thank you so much. Everyone, if you enjoyed Wes's chat, his workshop, his Q&A session, his thought leadership, uh, show us some love to give the heart emojis. But yeah, okay, we got a, some claps, thumbs up. <laughs> uh, we'll be sending out some people are asking about the follow up. We'll, we'll send some stuff out uh, within the next 48 hours with a recording of this. Everything lives on YouTube as well fi.co slash YouTube. We'll send out Wes's LinkedIn as well. So hopefully he'll join. Um, you can ex connect with him there. But uh, let's wrap things up. We're going to end things. Um, well, everyone can jump into the networking tables. I know Wes has to hop off, but Wes, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you, it seemed like you had a lot of fun, but I hope I you had This is great. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Awesome. Well, we'll, we'll wrap things up. Uh, thanks, everyone. We'll see you in the networking session.